Okay, so uh, thank you for coming to my talk today on techniques for efficient rapid prototyping. Uh, my name is Jack Burfield. I'm a games programmer for Mag Interactive down in Brighton. But uh, I've actually only been working at Mag for a couple of weeks now. Uh, and beforehand, I was working for Fatfish Games, uh, where for the past sort of year or so, we've been using rapid prototyping to maximize our efficiency and minimize our risk when creating new projects. So what do I mean when I say rapid prototyping? Obviously, prototyping is sort of a word that gets used quite a lot. Um, but in the case of this talk, what I'm talking about is creating a sort of fully functional game in as short amount of time as possible. Uh, or in the case of us at Fatfish Games, it was done sort of start to finish, start to publish in just five days. It's about focusing on a single sort of game mechanic and building the whole game sort of around that. Uh, and it's about doing this a lot. It's about doing this sort of as many times as possible, throwing lots and lots of apps onto the App Store and seeing what sort of sticks. So why would you want to do that? Um, well, while I was working at Fatfish, we created a game called Tiny Striker World Football. Um, and it did really well, and it was really well received, and we were really happy with it. Uh, but the trouble was that we, we spent sort of a year, or over a year even, uh, developing it. And all that time, we had no real idea whether or not people were going to like it, whether or not people would enjoy the sort of base gameplay mechanic. Um, and it could have been that we released the game and they didn't like that. Uh, and, you know, we would have sort of wasted a year's development time. And that's a, obviously a really bad thing to do. So, um, that's where sort of rapid prototyping comes in, is that it, because it takes such a short amount of time to develop, it doesn't matter if the game idea isn't well, well received. Um, and, yeah, so it also sort of gives you a chance to open up a bit more creative freedom in your company. So, you know, anyone can now sort of pitch an idea, see it get sort of built and published even, uh, just because, again, it takes such a short amount of development time. You can sort of take these risks with these little projects. So now I've sort of talked about what rapid prototyping is and why you might want to do it. Uh, we can go on to sort of a few tips and techniques uh, if you want to try it yourself. So first thing first is obviously you need to think of a few ideas and the golden rule here is obviously keep it simple. Um, you know, you're not going to be making this sort of amazing game that you've been planning on making your entire life. Uh, you, you just don't have time to do that. You want to be, as I say, sort of focusing on a really sort of small game mechanic, maybe, maybe one or two mechanics, but you know, as I say, just real sort of simple ideas. You want to imagine the gameplay and not the graphics. So it can be really tempting when you're coming up with these ideas to say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some sort of amazing sort of spaceship game uh, or something like that. Um, and you kind of want to avoid that. What you want to be looking to do is think about your gameplay in the form of just sort of basic shapes, uh, sort of shapes and colors, squares and triangles and that sort of thing. Um, because it means you can focus on whether or not your gameplay mechanic is going to be sort of fun. And after that, you know, once you've sort of released your prototype and people like it, you can take it back and then improve the sort of graphical quality of it. That's not to say that graphics aren't sort of important while making your prototypes. And I'm going to move on to that a little bit later in the presentation. Estimate the development time. As I say, you've only got sort of five days. Uh, and that's got to include testing. It's got to include publishing. It's got to include sort of a chance for anything to go horribly, horribly wrong. Um, so. Think about your game. Think about how feasible it is to get that done in five days. Uh, if you're not sort of a programmer yourself, you know, have a chat with your programmer. See if he thinks it's going to be feasible or not. Um, and then, yeah, just sort of go from there. Argue with someone. So this is something that we found was actually really useful. If you, if you, once you've come up with your idea, find someone and sit down with them, tell them your idea, and sort of ask them to sort of pick holes in it uh, and find problems with it. Because it's, it's better to find problems with your idea at this stage than obviously three days into development um, when it's going to be sort of causing a massive problem. So it's sort of like debugging your game before you've even written any code. Don't scrap ideas. Be willing to put them aside. So you've thought up an idea, and maybe it's going to take too long to make. Maybe it just doesn't work as a full sort of game loop, whatever the case may be. Um, it's important to try to not panic and sort of try to mutate your game idea into something that will work, you know, under pressure as such, it's a, you'll end up with sort of a much weaker idea than if you sort of take that, that original idea, put it aside, 
and allow it to sort of inspire you for future, stronger, fuller ideas. So once you've got a few ideas, a few concepts, um, you want to pop them on a list. So we used just Google Sheets for this. It meant that everyone can sort of comment and, and add ideas sort of at their leisure. Um, and when you pop the ideas on the list, try to make sure that you're sort of being as descriptive as possible. You really want people to be able to understand your prototype just by sort of looking at it. Um, ideally, these games should be so simple that it doesn't, you know, it's not going to take a massive amount of text. Uh, and be sure to sort of link to sort of pictures and then even sort of other games that will help explain to someone who doesn't know your idea exactly what you want to do. Once you've got those sort of things, those ideas on a list, um, you need to sort of rate them by how sort of feasible it's going to be to make them in five days and just how much you actually like the idea. Um, we had about three people giving each of our ideas a 0 to 10 rating and then obviously the highest rating ones got, it got sort of made first. And the sort of lower ones had a bit more chance to be thought about and improve upon uh, and so they, they became better ideas and then moved up the list and got worked on. And it's also another thing to watch out for. When you're sort of working through your list of prototypes and you come up with a new idea, it can be really tempting to be sort of like, oh my god, I've got, I've got the best idea ever. <laughs> we should scrap absolutely everything we're doing and, and get to work straight away on this new idea. Uh, and obviously you want to sort of avoid that. Um, you want to put that idea on the list. You want to, as I say, argue with someone about it and you know, go through the whole steps that you, you do for all your ideas because you, you might find, it happened to us a couple of times, that you jump on this new idea that you've had that you're really excited about and it, and it doesn't work. It's, it hasn't been thought about enough. So before you actually get started building your prototypes, um, something we had at Fat Fish, which was really handy, was a base project. And this is essentially like a template from which all your prototypes will be built. Uh, and it contains things that will save you time, things that you find yourself repeating every time you start making a prototype. Uh, a couple examples of things that we had in our, in our base project of Fat Fish was a, a title gameplay and game over screen. So all of our prototypes, it turned out, were essentially just these three, uh, three screens. So obviously title screen with a high score on it, gameplay screen where the actual gameplay happens, and then a game over screen again with probably a high score on it, and they would just loop round. Um, so we put these in our, in our base project, and that way we didn't have to spend a little bit of time every time we started a new prototype remaking these. Uh, so we had loads of different scripts and classes and things in our base project, but a couple of things that sort of seem obvious now, but we didn't have straight away, uh, a score manager. So just something where a little class where we can you know, manipulate a score, save and load a high score. Um, we were doing this every time we made a prototype, and it was taking you know, not a massive amount of time, but some time. Uh, and you really want to avoid wasting any time at all. Um, a pooling class. So yeah, an object pooling class like, it, it was good that it was there because we would have made the game without it. We wouldn't bother making a, a sort of object pooling system every time we made these prototypes because, as I say, we're doing this as quickly as possible. So having one there to use meant that it got used and meant that our game was more efficient. Basic graphics and sprites. So as I said earlier, you want to be thinking about your games uh, as sort of squares and triangles and circles. So having these squares and circles and things to hand means that your developers can just sort of grab them get started straight away, um, and, and it will just save them time early on. Some of our games didn't consist of anything more than circles and squares and colors. So once you've actually started developing, a um, couple of things to think about. One is that ideally you want to be testing as often as you can. Um, so whenever you come up with a new gameplay mechanic or a new feature, you want to be building out and getting that on a device and getting that in the hands of someone who can try it out. Um, obviously, building takes a lot of time, so you know, don't go crazy with it. You know, aim for sort of one or two builds a day. Uh, certainly, whatever you do, don't you know, sort of work on your prototype all week, and then on the last day, build it on the device and try it out because you'll find some problems. You know, you're bound to find, find problems, um, and you'll have no time left to fix them. Well, this was a really handy thing we had. It's just um, a little system that could grab data down from, from Google Sheets and then you know, sort of adjust the gameplay without having to do a build. It sort of live grabbed variables down. So if we wanted to adjust the speed of an enemy or the amount of score that something gave you, we could just adjust the value on the, online on this Google Sheet uh, and it would instantly update the game. And we, it meant we could get a really good 
sort of gain feel um, really quickly uh, and really easily. And obviously, with any project, you want to watch out for sort of feature creep. Um, if you find that you do want to put a new feature in your game, you think you can, then you, yeah, obviously think about it again in sort of terms of development time. Are you going to be able to fit this in in that five day sort of time limit? Um, and if not, leave it. You don't need it. You can put it in if the base game is successful. You can put that in later. Um, and again, sort of similar for when you're coming up with your ideas as when you're working on them, you might find three days in development, oh no, this isn't gonna, this isn't gonna fly, this isn't gonna work. Um, at that point, again, try not to panic, try not to mutate the game into something new, um, because at that point you're essentially making a new idea, and that new idea should go through the whole sort of steps that I, I mentioned earlier to make sure that it's solid enough to get worked on. So I mentioned earlier, graphics are pretty important. Um, so I made a couple of mock-ups here of some examples of how graphics can be used. Um, the main problem is tutorials. Um, obviously, tutorials can take a fair amount of development time to make. Um, and at the same time, with these sort of little casual games, a lot of users just won't, won't look at them, won't use them. Um, and if they don't use your tutorial and they try to play the game they don't understand, they're not going to like it, they're not going to open it up again, and the app's gonna, ultimately going to fail. So graphics become really important. Uh, and the idea is just to be as obvious as possible. So start with like the title. Don't pop the balloon. It's an instruction. People get it. I'm supposed to not pop a balloon. There's a picture of a balloon. They're going to sort of add, it up, add that up. Uh, another really cool thing. Um, so rather than having like a start button on your, on your main menu, get the user to do whatever action it is that consists of the controls of the game in order to start the game. So in this case, the user will swipe to begin, left or right and the balloon will move left or right, and they've learned how to move the balloon in the first sort of second of gameplay, and that's really all they need to know about the game. Uh, another really useful thing is using like real-world concepts and things that people can relate to to teach people about the mechanics of the game. So in this case, you're a balloon. People understand that if a spiky thing touches a balloon, it will pop. People know that they're not supposed to pop the balloon. People know how to move the balloon now to avoid the spiky things, and they've kind of got the whole game sorted out. Coins are another good example of that. It's just, obviously, people know that getting money is a good thing, so generally people will pick that up. So once you're ready to sort of release your prototype, um, a couple of things. Aim for a single app store. So don't try to take your prototype and put it on you know, Google Play, put it on iTunes, whatever. Um, it's not necessary. It's not really about getting these prototypes in the hands of as many people as possible. It's more about getting whoever does get your game to come back to the game as often as possible. Um, and also, don't, try, don't release one prototype on Google Play and another prototype on iTunes. Just sort of pick an app store and go with that because it makes it easier to compare the performance of all of your apps. So you don't need to track a lot of analytics. You basically just need to know when people are opening the game and how often they're opening the game. Uh, and that way you can start putting forward some retention goals. Um, so these have got to be pretty high. When we were at Fat Fish, we were looking for sort of around 60 to 70% day one retention, uh, about sort of 40% week one retention, uh, and sort of 10 to 20, maybe two week, one month retention. Um, as I say, you're looking for something really good. You're not looking for any sort of okay games. And don't bother monetizing. So don't bother... Um, you know, putting any in-app payments in, don't bother putting any adverts in, certainly don't charge for the app itself. Um, that's not really what this is about. This is just throwing your game idea out there and seeing if people like it. And if they do, that's great. Take it, grab it back, you know, put as many features in as you want, spend as long, as long on it as you want, and, uh, you know, put all the lovely graphics and all that sort of stuff, because you're now confident that the game that you're working on is something that people are really going to enjoy. Uh, and that's pretty much what rapid prototyping is all about. Um, so I think we have time for a couple of questions, if anyone's got anything. Yeah? The question would be, does this only work for casual games, or how fast would you go like for a more complex game, like an MMO or something like that? So I suppose, yeah, so uh, the question was, if you didn't hear, um, how well would this work for sort of more complex games? Is it just for sort of simple games? Um, and what I would say is probably the best idea is, as far as your prototypes go, if you're planning on making a more complex game, test out 
parts of that complex game. So make lots of little prototypes that will eventually consist all of the gameplay mechanics of your more complicated game. So, you know, say it's a shooting sort of game, have one prototype that's about the shooting, one prototype that's about the uh, movement, or whatever the case may be, and test out those little mechanics. And that way you can kind of Lego brick together a more complicated idea later. Oh, uh, yeah? How did you decide to do it on five days? Why not a week? Why not seven? Why not three days? Why five? So the question was there, well, why did we decide to use five days? Um, that's, it was sort of just a number we plucked, really. Um, obviously, five days is just one working week, so uh, we decided to just go with that. We could have gone with two weeks. We could have gone with a shorter amount of time, but uh, the sort of golden rule would be don't change it between prototypes. All your prototypes should probably be given you know, the same time limit. Uh, and that way you're not thinking, well, I did two weeks on this game and one week on that game, but had I spent two weeks on that game, would it have done better? It makes it a little easier to compare if everything's sort of in the same time frame. And there's a lot of developers who do the same principle, and I think two is quite common, but like you say, five is also common. Great. Anything else? Oh, yeah? From what, like in average, maybe? So, sorry, I didn't quite catch. Uh, an average, an average of uh, the users that you get for for these apps. So, how many users? Yeah. I mean, it really depends. Um, if, if we had a little bit of money to spend on sort of advertising the prototype, we would. Um, but it's, as I say, it's not really about how many users you get in. Uh, as I say, it's more about getting whatever users do find your app to keep coming back. Um, but I, so I'm not sure exactly what the sort of average number was. As I say, it sort of varied quite, quite a lot between different apps. And it can be really effective if you want to use something like Facebook ads to find people who, who are like the target audience you have in mind. Because then you can get a couple of hundred players, potentially, for not very much money. And that gives you lots of data. You can then understand whether that worked and how it worked. Exactly. Thank <laughs> you.